Well, good morning. All right. Nice and peppy. I like it. Uh, my name is Jared Weaver. I'm the executive pastor here at Vintage Grace. Uh, I get the privilege of being a part of the ministry here in that way. And a lot of people go, well, what does that mean? And uh, I think I've come to the conclusion, uh, the best way to describe that is I call myself the oil guy, right? Like make things run a little smoother, make things go uh, better than they are. Because are things going well at Vintage Grace? Is God good to Vintage Grace? It is. He is. I mean, it has, been, it has been incredible to be here for the last seven months, and so I, I'm grateful for that and grateful for the opportunity to, to potentially, I think, serve in my lane. Uh, we'll find out um, as the years go on. But I have two kiddos. Uh, one is Xander. He is four. He's our little boy. And Karis, who is seven. Now, Karis is seven. That means that she's realizing the very real reality that Life can be difficult sometimes. Life doesn't go as you would anticipate, and people don't always do what you want, right? Like on the playground, she had an issue with a boy this week who had some circumstances that she had to work out. Now, I'm the oil guy at Vintage Grace. That means I'm a professional smoother out. Like, that's my job is to to iron out all the kinks, right? And so that's what I want to do with my daughter when I hear that there's difficulty in her life is, okay, daddy's got it. I got the big iron. I'm going to smooth all this out for you. Well, learning as a parent that... You can't remove all the hard things in our kiddos' lives. And so I am realizing that I have a different role. My job is to help her navigate the the difficult terrain, to help her navigate hard things, to help her hope in hard times. Because would you agree with me this morning that life can be hard? Yeah? Is life hard? You can just say, yeah, it is, right? And so when life doesn't go the way you want, it can be hurtful, right? It's painful. And at Vintage Grace, we call pain uh, a certain definition. It's the, the gap between our desire state and our act, act, desire, yeah, present state, actual state, where we're at. I didn't set that one up well. See, Drew? <laughs> sorry. It's not, ah, sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm newer to the PowerPoint thing. It's, it's less my thing, so I'm working on it, though. But sometimes that gap can be like this. A little hop, a little leap. Maybe, maybe you, a little light came on on your dash this week in the car, and you're like, ah, oh, i got to go deal with that. i got to take care of the car. I, I don't like to do that. That's not much fun. Or, or you missed something on your calendar, and you missed an important, kind of important meeting, and so that made life just a little more difficult, right? And so, so sometimes the, the pain we experience is, is like that, just jumping over a little crack. And sometimes the pain we experience is like that, like, like Frogger. I, I guess this is, again, I'm getting contemporary here, right? So this is Crossy Road, which is like, the modern day frogger, okay? So just FYI for you. But sometimes that gap is, is like trying to traverse that. Like you go left, you go right, you go forward, you go backwards, but you're like, I, I need to get there. I need to get there. Maybe, maybe that was a, a family blow up this, this Christmas. And now you got some issues that you got to deal with. And how do you, how do you navigate that? Or, or perhaps doctor says, need a new diet, got to change how you live your life in that way in significant ways. And so sometimes that's the pain we feel. And other times, The gap we feel is something like this, tumbling off Niagara Falls with no hope of getting back, right? Like, like I I know I need to be on the top. Like, that's where I want to be, but I'm down here, and that's a really long ways away, and that's a really hard place to get to. That could be cancer that calls. Could be your marriage that's crumbling in. Could be your children going wayward, not the way that you anticipated or it could be your career collapsing before you. Right? You're like, what, what's happening here? What, what is going on? And so I, t- I take you down this road because last year at this time, my wife is named Anna D. I like her. She's a great woman. Um, we were, we were, we were, for us, the days were short, the nights were dark, and the snow was cold. It was a long long season, winter of 2017, as we were scrambling to make sense of what God was doing through the death of a dream. Have you ever hoped in something and worked hard for something and spent years working toward it and have it, have it come to nothing? See, it was the death of a dream. Four years ago, we moved to this place. It's a beautiful place, isn't it? Wouldn't you want to live there? Like, that's just, like, like just, just, behind where I I lived. It was great. It was a great, great place. Great community. It's called Wenatchee, Washington, with the hopes of restoring and revitalizing a church, a small church, a struggling church that had asked their two former pastors to leave for pornography and deceitfulness and just all kind of, just kind of yucky stuff, right? Difficult things to work through. 
And so I'd spent the previous five years before Wenatchee in Sonoma County in the Rona Park area and uh, revitalizing a small church there. I've partnered with a, a fellow ministry partner and, and we really saw God kind of change things and some markers of health and discipleship. And it's in that season, I would say, I, I grew to love the gospel. Like, like this gospel changes me today. Not like it changed me, it's changing me. Isn't that great? Like that's what the gospel does. So it's changing me today and I, 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 I gained an understanding of that and I fell in love with that and then I fell in love with, with the church, the community that God has created, this local manifestation of, of the body of Christ. And so I loved the church, but I didn't really love Sonoma County, right? I, I didn't love Rona Park. It wasn't my place because my heart was in the PNW. That's Pacific Northwest for some of you guys, right? That's where I'm from, from the Pacific Northwest. I'm from the small town. And so here we had, right? This is like, like all the signs, like you're always trying to wonder what God's leading you to, right? You love the church. Here's a church that needs help. Here we go, right? This is what God wants us to do. And so we were confident. We were confident in the gospel. We were nine months pregnant, or Anadi was nine months pregnant at the time. And we were headed to Wenatchee, Washington, and here we go. I, I, here's, the, here's, the, here's what's going to happen. We were going to do the old-fashioned Indiana Jones step of faith. You know what I'm talking about, right? You take that step. Here we go. We're going to do that. And so here was the story, right? The story for God's fame was young family takes a risk because who, who moves when their wife's nine months pregnant? Dumb people do, right? <laughs> and so we're going to go, we're going to have a church that's no longer surviving, but it's going to go to thriving. And we're going to see the gospel advance in, in a valley, a beautiful valley, right? We're going to see the gospel advance to 100,000 people. Like, this is what we want to do. Like, this is great, right? God wants this to happen. Fast forward three years. October 22nd, 2016, our church had what we called a celebration of life service where we ceased to exist as a local church anymore because we came to the conclusion that we best, uh, we best move forward the kingdom, we best serve the kingdom of Christ by, by no longer existing as a church and aligning ourselves with a like-minded church that is moving and thriving and pushing itself forward. And so we gathered for the last time and it was in that space that the darkness of January, like, have you ever been where it's just cold in the winter in January? That is a long, long period. And not have a job? And not have, like, it, it's a tough season. So here's my, here's my journal from last year is, since handing over the keys to our landlord, I've, this was for the church, I've struggled to feel like I fit anywhere because my clear purpose for the day was handed over. It was my job that closed. My community that ended. My church that disbanded. All that I knew in Wenatchee, the reason for mo moving to Wenatchee was no more because we went there to love those people and to love that church and to see it thrive and to see it flourish. And it was no more. We gave it all we got. All we knew and all we fought for was gone. This was a Niagara Falls gap in our lives. Like, and it was just going. Like Niagara Falls never ended kind of feeling. Because you start to wrestle with those feelings of feeling like a failure. And on the outside, from, from, from perception, people look at you and go, you guys can't hack it. You feel like you're on the, on the verge of losing hope. Desperation is knocking and the death of a dream is all happening at this same time. And so my question for us is this, is how do we hope in that space? How do we hope in those hard times? When God takes us down a road that we're not really interested in going. Like, like if you told me ahead of time, God, this is the road I'm going to take you, I'd have been like, yeah, I think I'm going to go this way. Right? That, that's, I would have done the old Jonah probably. Right? Which, which way? Uh, 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 complete opposite. Because here's the truth. Pain isn't a Jared thing, is it? It's a human thing. It's everybody. Like I haven't cornered the market on pain. Right? My, my, everybody in this room experiences pain to some degree or another. So the question is not if you have pain, it's where is your pain? What's the pain? What's causing the difficulties? And, and do you not, would you not, friend, want to have hope in those times? You want hope in that gap when difficulty comes? You see, this is especially important when because Jesus is going to begin to paint a very bleak picture for his special city in the whole of creation. 
We're about to, to picture and to see some, some very significant pain and destruction. And so we need to understand, how do I hope in that? Where do I go? Where do I turn? And we're going to see that things are going to get worse before they get better. So I thank Drew for the slap on the butt sermon today. Right? No, this is tough. This is tough stuff for us to walk through. But it's a big ask for you to, to walk with. Stay with me. Right? Because we're going we're to walk through some difficult things in hopes that we would recognize where our hope is to be in the midst of those things. When those difficult times come. And so the summary of Luke 21, 20 through 28 is this. Jesus' bleak and terror-filled picture of Jerusalem's destruction previews the terror-filled end, signaled by cosmic signs and the hope-inducing authoritative return of Jesus. That's, a, that's just basically this passage in Jared's synopsized nutshell. So let's read now the word of the Lord found in Luke 21. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies... Then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. Let not those who are out in the country enter it, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and, great, and wrath against his, this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword. Be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Great God, we pray this morning that that you would speak to us, that you would minister to us through through the very real truth that difficulty is coming upon your creation and upon your special city. God, would you speak to us, and speak to the hearts of your people here, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so we pick up from last week is, is 5 through 19 is Jesus is basically unpacking for the disciples. Life's going to get difficult for you, disciples. Right? Like it's going to be a difficult thing for you as you move forward. And you're going you're gonna to experience persecution and, and martyrdom. You're going to die for whose name? Jesus' name. For my name. That's what he says. So that's, that's where we find ourselves picking up. And so as we go through this passage, we're going to ask this question. How do we hope in hard times? How do we hope in the midst of these very real hard times that we see pictured here? And the first thing we do to hope in hard times is we remember this. Jesus said, Jesus did. Jesus said, Jesus did. Now, what did Jesus say? He said that the the desolation or the destruction of his city is going to take place. Look at verse 20. And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation has come near. It's important to understand that Jerusalem was God's city. And Jerusalem contained God's people because God's people weren't just like this random bunch of people that have just found themselves there in the last few years. No, these are God's people that that, that hearken all the way back to Genesis 12 when God says to Abraham, I'm going to create a nation from you. And so this is God's promise being fulfilled in his particular city. And so we have God's people in his particular city. And what else is in God's city? God's presence. There's a particular place of importance in God's city. And what we find here is, and the Old Testament affirms this, is God's not interested in being a figurehead for Jewish people to go their own way. He's not really interested in saying, hey, you know, you want to attach my name to it, that's fine, that's cool. You guys can do it your own, your own thing. That's not his method. Jeremiah 22, 5 says, but if you will not obey these words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. So again, this is the just fulfillment of apocalyptic imagery that Jesus is, is, is giving. Micah 3, 12 Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. 
Even in Luke 19, Jesus has already wept before Jerusalem because they've missed who Jesus was. They've missed God's plan of the kingdom. But destruction shouldn't be surprise for God's city or the city of God when they fail to be faithful to God. And that's what we have here. And so Jesus is saying, desolation is coming. Now, who brings this desolation? The Gentiles? The armies? Well, look, look even further. Look at verse 22. It says, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written here. This days of vengeance is, is God promising to judge his city for their unfaithfulness. Jeremiah 5, 9 says, Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? So God promises that if for his people who have gone their own way and basically may put themselves on the throne, judgment will come for this particular city, for these particular people. And the severity of that judgment is made clear by this call to flee. He basically says, get out of Dodge, right? Like, like if, you, if you're in the city, you, you gotta get out. If you're near the city, you gotta get out. And if you're thinking about going to the city, don't come. Don't go anywhere near Jerusalem. And that severity is then continued as, as verses 23 and 24 talk about pregnancy and nursing children, which pictures a blessed and vulnerable person, now they're going to incur great difficulty as a result of that. So what was a blessing now becomes difficulty. Distress and wrath and sword allude to God's judgment. Till till finally there at the end it says, until the days of the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, it's kind of hard to find clarity on this. You read a bunch of scholars and they all kind of have their own take as to what exactly this means. So we have to have measured statements in what this exactly entails or what it exactly means. It probably refers to our current time when Gentiles serve as both the destroyer and the mission field for God's people. They're the ones who are going to bring this destruction, but they're also the ones upon whom God is what? Reaching. He's going out to to save and to rescue, of, of which probably many of us would be included. In fact, all of us. And this idea of a time of Gentiles suggests that there is a time when Jerusalem or Israel will repent and restoration will take place place. And so Jesus said, but let's also remember that Jesus did. You see, we're going to take a moment to understand that Jesus did bring about the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's not not an effort to celebrate, hey, look, that that destruction took place. Rather, it it serves to to encourage or to support our, our hope that when God says something, God does what he says, right? It's 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 to say, I've promised that this will happen. I predict it will happen. And guess what? It did happen. And so the Jewish people went on to poke the bear in 66 AD. And they did that by interrupting Roman sacrifices to Caesar. And then four years of ongoing battle, 66 to 70 AD, that's going back and forth between the Jewish people and the Roman people until Roman general Titus took over. He cut off supplies to the city And then in the spring of 70 AD, he breached one of the walls. And then no one could go in or out, cut it off again. No one goes in, no one goes out. And by the fall of 70 AD, there was burning and sacking of the city that took place. And so here we have, Jesus said this would happen, and guess what? It did happen. And so Luke's description of this siege and destruction reflect normal strategy for taking a fortified city. So, so what we think here, or understand here, is that this is just, how, how would you defeat a city, a fortified city like Jerusalem? Well, you do what General Titus did. That's essentially what the idea is. And so the connection this morning is this, is that remember, what Jesus said will happen, did happen. And it was true with Jerusalem, but also make the connection that it was true with my own life, my own experience. You see that experience up there? Jesus has made a promise. He made a promise to me that he's better. Jesus is better, that he's sufficient, that he's good, that he loves me, that he's trustworthy, that he's enough. He made that promise. And I can tell you, he fulfilled that promise, even in the midst of difficult times, because the sweetness of Jesus' fellowship in my darkness was better 
Right? Like what, who I got to experience Jesus to be in that moment was better than any title could give me, was better than any financial security I could have, was better than any significance somebody could give to me from the outside. Who I knew him to be in that moment is something I will treasure and cherish for all of this life. Because it's in that context, in that space, in the darkness of the winter, you go, Jesus, are you sufficient? Jesus, are you enough? And you go, I guess you are, because I'm surviving. And that's all you got sometimes. Let me just be honest. Like, you know, there's nothing, nothing spiritual about this. Like, it's rough. But you start fighting like the Dickens. Like, Jesus, would you be enough for me today? Would you be enough for me today? And in that moment, you're desperate and dependent, and you're clinging to Jesus, and you're like, your sweetness of your fellowship is so good. So much so that there was almost fear and trepidation to come to a place like Vintage Grace. Because at Vintage Grace, we talked about God's doing good things. Great things. And in that, there's a temptation, right? To not need Jesus as much. Because I'm getting affirmations. There's almost a safety net in saying, no, God, I need you here. Help me to need you here. That's the prayer I have today for my heart. And so where has Jesus been better in your life today? Where can you identify a spot when you took that Indiana Jones step of faith and Jesus proved himself to be better in your heart, in your life, in your experience? Remember that. Maybe it was in your, with your family. Maybe it was something God was calling you to. You just know that he was calling you to do it and you took that step and you did it. And God was like, I got you. I got your back. I got you. Your finances, your work life. Identify that. Like God, God, thank you for being faithful there. Thank you for being faithful there because that will support you and encourage you as you move forward in hoping in him. Or maybe right now he's asking you to do that. He's like, I got you, you're, right? You're like, I, well, that Indiana Jones step of faith. And you're like, wait, wait, just let me get the, let me get the gravel, right? Like, throw that out there, then I'll take the step. Uh -uh. God's like, I got you. I'm better. And who who you're going to experience me to be, you won't experience if you can see the road ahead sometimes. And so Jesus said, Jesus did. Second thing we need to remember is this, is that Jesus said, Jesus will. Jesus said, Jesus will. You see, the destruction of the temple doesn't sit in isolation for us this morning. Rather, the destruction of the temple is a foreshadowing or a previewing or a mirror, if you will, of what is to come for all of creation. And so God is going to bring destruction on Jerusalem, and that foreshadows or mirrors what he's going to do to the whole of creation. And so here's where we want to bank on what is true and what is certain when we start getting into these realms. Like, God, what is it that you've told me is true and is certain? First thing is this. Jesus gives a certainty regarding the destruction of all things. And he does that through creation. He says this, that creation itself will signal the onset of the creator's judgment through the cosmic signs. You will see things in the heavens and the stars and the sun and the moon that will, that will, that will tell you God is up to something. God is doing something, something is going on here. The cosmic signs are telling me this. What we find here is that Jesus is becoming like an Old Testament prophet. He's, he's pulling out apocalyptic imagery here, saying, okay, here's, here's what it looks like when, when God does his work. Isaiah 13.9 says, behold, the day of the Lord comes. Now, day of the Lord was, was the Old Testament word for the, for the end, for the end of all things. The day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark as it's rising, and the moon will not shed its light. What's the saying? As sure as the morning sun. But something's going to happen, right? It's, it's not going to be as sure as that anymore. That's going to get your attention. Ezekiel 32 says, When I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. 
And Joel 2.10 says, The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. You see, Luke is informing us that something significant, something massive in the cosmos is going to take place, and it's going to be signs that you, you, you basically will be undeniable to you. Because Luke is actually gives us the least amount of information as far as the, in, the end and what's going to happen. He's, he's pretty simple, right? What's he say? Uh, there will be signs in sun, moon, and stars. Like, okay. There's not a lot of specifics there, right? Because what is Luke telling us? He's telling us that, that when you see it, you're going to know. It, it, it's going to be clear. And we also know that people will be with fear, be overcome with fear, foreboding. Verse 26, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. The only natural response to apocalyptic imagery is that it invokes fear in us, doesn't it? I see that and I go, man, that, God, like, wow. That's heavy. That's a lot. What do I do with this? And even the pervasiveness is shown then by the heavens being shaken because Jesus rules and reigns over every square inch of heaven and earth. And there's nothing that he doesn't own. There's nothing that he doesn't, he isn't over. There's nothing he's not going to impact and turn upside down. And so certainty, just as unmistakable destruction and terror come upon Jerusalem in 70 AD, so it will come upon all of creation. Friend, this is a sad thing. This is a difficult, like reading this, these passages this week was one of those experiences where you, you start, you read and you go, okay, that's going to happen, that's going to happen. And then you start reading those Old Testament imageries and what's going on and you're like, you're kind of, I was hit with the reality, like, holy smokes. Like, God, what are you up to? I don't know. It's going to be hard. God, who doesn't know about Jesus? Like, does that not invoke that in you? Like, who doesn't know about Jesus? Like, this is coming, this is real. God, help me, to, help me to give a rip about my neighbor right now. And so there's sadness and sorrow right here. Like, it's okay, again, pastorally. Like, you can admit that. That's what's going on here. But Jesus goes on to give us certainty regarding himself. And this certainty comes through what I call divine flexing. Right? Jesus is like... Right here. This is what he does. He does that divine flexing. I'm sure Jesus can do this one day, right? He does this divine flexing through this title called the Son of Man. He's like, I got it. Right? Daniel 7, we're made aware of the hope of this Son of Man, this one who, who comes from the heavens, who has rule and reign over the earth. All areas, his dominion, his glory, his authority, his honor is far reaching in every aspect. And you know what he's going to bring for his people, this son of man who, who comes from the heaven that the Ancient of Days gives this you know, authority to? You know what he's going to bring? Vindication for his people. And so Jesus is saying, vindication is coming for his people. He brings vindication to his suffering people. And this is the moment that the disciples are waiting for. Remember in Acts 1 where he says, where the disciples are, are there and he says, you are to go and be my witness into Judea, Jer Jerusalem, and Samaria, and all to the ends of the earth? What are they, they ask right before they say, is this now the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Like, and this is, what, this is what Jesus said. This is now. That's when it's going to happen. Right? What you see with these eyes are going to be the exact same thing that you see with your faith eyes. And so we have this image of divine flexing through the title, the Son of Man. But then we have an image of divine flexing through an image of riding on clouds. See, Jesus is riding on a cloud. Now, now, riding on a cloud wasn't a Mario thing, right? Like, if you remember, back in the day, if you bonk off the guy, you get on there and you get to ride, Mar you get to ride on the cloud. Like, like the, that's not a Mario thing. It's a God thing. Because God created all things. He created clouds. And what does God use? He uses the cloud by day and the fire by night to lead his people. God is in control of the clouds. And so you, here you have this title of this son of man jumping into a cloud Right? Almost this picture of like him riding a cloud like a bull down. Like, I got this, people. I'm in control. I'm in authority. I rule even over this moment, even in the midst of destruction. Who is ruling and reigning? Jesus, your king. Your, the one you follow is the one who rules in that moment. 
So can you just picture that? Like, here it comes, right? The authority of Jesus is put on full and glorious display. Verses 25 and 26 tell us about fear and destruction and the, earth, the heavens being shaken. And now we have this divine flexing of Jesus. And for whose benefit is that divine flexing? Who benefit? You. Yeah, us. We benefit from Jesus saying, I got this. I got you. I got you. Even in the midst of this difficulty, even in the midst of destruction, even in things that you can't even fathom, I got you. I rule over that. I reign over that. I got it. Don't take my word for it, right? Because we need to see what Jesus says. Look at verse 28. Now when these things begin to take place, what's he say? Straighten up. Get a little hope. Hope is rising, right? It's rising. Straighten up. Raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Hope is rising. Hope, hope, hope is coming. Do you remember? Maybe you don't. I'll tell you if you do. You'll find out in a minute. Batman. Batman begins. The one with Christian Bale. I don't believe in the other Batmans. They don't exist. And I don't believe in the ones afterwards either. They don't exist. There's three good Batmans. And in the middle there, I think it's called The Dark Knight Rises, right? The one with the Joker crazy thing, that thing going on, right? And in the middle there, there's the guy, uh, Harvey Dent, and he says, the night is darkest just before the dawn. And here we have that picture. Like, it's as dark and as bleak as possible, and then come, come piercing into the darkness is Jesus, bull riding the cloud saying, I got it. I got it, people. I got it, you my people. You who are in me, I got you. Straighten up. Have hope. Redemption is coming, not just for you, but for the whole of creation. So while the destruction is coming, redemption is also on its way. Straighten up. Raise your drooping heads, for all that is sad is coming untrue. So Gandalf says, Jesus says this, though. It's a little better. It's always better. <laughs> Revelation 21.5, Behold, I am making all things new. It's what he's up to. It's what he's doing. And so Jesus gives us certainty regarding the destruction of all things. He gives us certainty about his authority, but he does not give us certainty about what? The length of the gap. The gap between Jerusalem and the end. Do I know? Nope. Will I know? Nope. Went to three years of school, full time, did my thing, right? Nope. Nobody there knew either. That was a bummer, right? And you pay money, you're like, hey, don't you guys know anything around here? <laughs> Turns out nobody knows. So you don't have to pay the money, you don't have to go, I'll just let you know. That's what it is. Nobody knows. But what's our job in the gap? We hope. We hope in the gap. We hope in the one who rules and reigns over all things. And we, and we hope that, that his, he's coming and he's going to bring his authority, he's going to bring redemption, he's going to bring all those things to us. And we hope. But we don't know when. So if you came this morning to get all the answers on what God was going to do, when he was going to do it, don't have them. But I know what he wants you to do. I can give you that. He wants you to hope. And so the day is coming, friends, when all the evils of this world will be made new. No more disappointments. Hear that? No more disappointments. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more sickness. No more sadness. And my favorite, no more fight and sin. It's over. That's done. I don't have to fight sin anymore because I just get tired of fighting sin, don't you? Gosh. And so here we are. We're not there, though. We're here. All right, we'll come back to 2018, where we are. Right here, right now. I don't want to go to 17. We find ourselves waiting, waiting for our king to come. Like, when's he coming? What's he doing? And it reminds me of the 2014, an image that I was trying to figure out. How do we make this connect this morning? And there was this image of, of the 2014 World Series. Who won the 2014 World Series? The Giants. See, see me? I'm trying to connect with you. 
right? Like I'm a Northwest guy. Mariners don't have anything, so it just doesn't happen. So, so it's easy, right? I'm connecting with you. The Giants won the 2014 World Series. But who really won the 2014 World Series? Who knows that? Who was, in, who was, the, who was the guy who won that thing? Madison Bumgardner, right? First two games, the World Series that he pitches, 16 innings, no runs, basically just dominates everything, right? If, you're, if you were a Giant fan, you're like, that's our guy. There's no question. That's our guy. And game seven, what's game seven? I mean, game seven is code for winner take all, all the marbles, the whole enchilada, whatever it is you want to call it. And so game seven was... I mean, I was, so I lived in Sonoma County. I lived in Sonoma County while the World Series championships of, uh, what are the other events, 2010 and 2012. So I enjoyed it. Again, Mariner fan, I don't enjoy anything. So I was enjoying you guys, right? Enjoying, have your fun. And, and I, I remember getting to that point in, in the game seven of the World Series. I'm rooting for them, even up north. Like, hey, here we go. The Giants would be fun. And game seven was like, all we got to do is do what? We just got to get Madison in there. Like, we got to get a lead. And Madison Bumgarner comes in. We got this. We got it. That's all we got to do. Once he's in, we're good. And that's what happened. They were all good. But I would imagine, I haven't talked to Bruce Bochy ever in my life, but I'm sure that Bruce Bochy was like, okay, well, what do we got to do in innings one through four before Madison can come in? What do we got to do? Go back to the fundamentals. Yeah, score. Do, do what you're supposed to do. Do the things that, that we've trained for. Right? Stay the course. Do everything that, God, that, that, that you're supposed to do. Right? Field the ball. Throw it. Don't, you know, run when you're supposed to. Don't try to take too much. Don't try to do it all yourself. Be a team player. Whatever baseball-y kinds of things that you want to say. <laughs> all we got to do is get there. You stay the course. Go back to the fundamentals. And once our guy comes in, we got this. And so here we are. There's your guy right there. We sit here waiting for our king waiting for our Savior to come out of the bullpen and to say, I got this. I got it. This one's mine. And we all, yes, there he is. Victory is ours. And so we wait in that moment right now. But we have to fight for hope in the meantime. We got to continue to fight for hope in the meantime by going back to the fundamentals the fundamentals of this, of this life in the gap is this. As we fight by going back and believing and living like lost people matter most. Do you recognize that you, friend, if you know Jesus, you are the hope of Jesus to those around you. You are his hope. He's platforming his hope through you and what you're up to. And doesn't knowing your purpose, like God has placed you, he's kept you here for really one purpose, to glorify him by making disciples of himself. And so knowing your purpose, does that not help you take another step forward? Like, oh, it's hard. This is hard, but, it, but we're doing what we're going to. We're doing what we're supposed to. We're doing what we're supposed to. And so your purpose is to be the hope of Jesus to lost people, to be the hope of Jesus to bring the light of the hope of Jesus to your workplace, to your schools, to your family functions, even there, right? <laughs> Civic organizations, your favorite restaurants. You bring the light of the hope of Jesus. That's your purpose. So you stay here and you wait by fulfilling your purpose of living like lost people matter most. Second way, you go back to the fundamentals, is you feast on the word you feast on God's promises because you need promises to anchor you in the times of difficulty. You need to say, oh, no, 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 that's not true, that is. Why? Because God said so, right, right here. You wanna know what God said? Right here, right here, God said so. You know, one of the anchoring promises to, to Anadi and I in that dark season was he will withhold no good thing for those who walk uprightly. Whoa. He will withhold no good thing for those who walk uprightly. Okay, God, help me to walk uprightly today. Help me to walk uprightly because you promised me and you said, because Jesus said, Jesus does, that, that you won't withhold anything good. So whatever comes my way, God, help me to believe that that is good. Help me to fight for that because I don't believe it today. 
but I know you can help me. So are you feasting in the 40 days of feasting? Jumping in. You can jump in today. You can jump in tomorrow. You can jump whenever. Like feast on his promises. Memorize. Read. Those are the things that will anchor you in the times of difficulty. Third fundamental is this. Feast on stories of his faithfulness. Hear about how God is being faithful in and amongst fellow followers of Jesus. Because when you see him, you're like, oh, God does actually still move. That's good news. I needed to believe that. I needed to see that. And so we get to see a story of that through the Hodges this morning. Hi, my name is Gerald. This is my wife, Carol. And this is our story. Our story actually began when I began to search for the meaning of life. Um, I lived in a home that wasn't Christian, Gerald did. We had no friends, no families that were Christian. And after 10 years of marriage, I really felt empty inside and I began to read the book of Revelation. The Holy Spirit in his mercy took the book of Revelation and showed me the holiness and righteousness of God and I learned to reverence him. And in that reverence, I learned to hate sin and I could see my own and my need for, for him to come in and to change and transform me. So I came to the cross, and the day I came, I really thought I was going to lose everything and have nothing, but I needed to know God. And in my surprise, the next morning, I was so filled with love and fulfillment and purpose. And the, the miracle of the whole thing is I began to read the Bible, and I understood it. I love teaching Revelation. I love seeing how prophecy can transform and change lives and get Christians to live more, commitment, more committed in their uh, discipleship. And then uh, Gerald is our last big trial, I think. Uh, not probably not, but anyway, he came down with the diagnosis of cancer, and I'll let him share a little bit about that. Yeah, I had cancer diagnosed when I was 74 years old. Uh, I went down to San Francisco University, San Francisco, I had an operation they took the cancer out of my head, and uh, I survived that. Uh, came home and did radiation for seven weeks. I was feeling pretty good for quite a few years, and, and then hey, two years ago, I was diagnosed with lung cancer, stage four lung cancer. And the doctors met with me, and they said that they didn't recommend at my age and, and the cancer, they didn't recommend me take anything, just to go ahead and live life the best I could. And I agreed with them, and uh, so all these many years later, I'm still still living with this lung cancer. I just had the diagnosis run, and they said it was still slow growing. People stop and ask me quite a bit, you know, how you doing? And I tell them I'm doing fine. And I said, I've decided I'm gonna live till I die, and you're gonna do the same. So God's been good to us, and, and I'm thankful for the life he's given us. Yeah. When confronted with the reality of the end, the Hodges give us a story of putting your hope in Jesus, putting your hope in God, saying, God, I trust you. I trust you. And our final fundamental this morning is this, is we get an opportunity to tangibly partake of, of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, of Jesus saying, I got you so much so that, that I went to the cross for you. I love you so much that, that I absorbed, remember all that wrath that we took pictures of, of the imagery that we saw? All that wrath for you and for me, for those of us in Jesus Christ, was absorbed by Jesus on the cross. And there's none left. There's nothing left. Just love for you as a child, as a child of God. And so what we get this morning is an opportunity to partake of, of the communion elements of reminding ourselves that, that God has sacrificed in such a way that we have hope renewed. We were hopeless, but God in Christ has given us hope. And so as, as you take these elements, be reminded this morning that God loves you and he sacrificed for you and that he, you're his child. And so this is an opportunity for those 
who would call themselves children of God. And, and if, if that's something you're, you're not sure of, or you're unaware of, I would love to have a conversation with you afterward. Or even our prayer team is to, to walking through, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to have Jesus as my hope of heaven? That would be the best conversation of all. And so we have, uh, I'll ask the ushers to come forward, invite them down, and we have gluten-free in the back. Uh, so go ahead and take this time to reflect on the fact that that God has sacrificed all to renew and restore your hope. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we we thank you and we delight this morning in in this truth. And and this fact is is that we have hope because of Jesus. The authoritative one who rules and reigns over every square inch of heaven, every square inch of this earth, every square inch of my life. He loves me. So much so that he would go to the cross, bear my sins for me, and give me his life. I get the perfect life of Jesus freely. And this supper this morning reminds me of that truth. And so God, would would you encourage, would you minister to your children's heart here today that you love them, that they tangibly get an opportunity to, to experience who you are and what you've done. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.